record you guys. Yeah. Yeah, I can give you a link. Is there a way we can pull up to the participants, like on the side, or no? I just want to be able to see everybody. Well, what it's doing now is these are the only people logged in. Okay, perfect. So it'll show them in a grid. Okay, great. That's perfect. Well, hey, everybody. Are we here? We're getting settled. Hi. Hi. We've got a couple of people um, walking in and uh, some people jumping on Zoom. Um, just grateful that you guys are here today. And just really being intentional, um, knowing how much like God intentionally put this study in our path for these weeks leading up to this, for this week, for today. Um, honestly, didn't know if anyone would even be in here today. You know, <laughs> are people going to actually show up? So thank you guys uh, for showing up, for being here, um, here and here. And then I know we've got some people logging on later because I'm going to be uh, recording this. Um, but just so thankful that we can come together as believers wherever we are in community and, and worship the true king who is really on the throne. So I want that to be the focus of our time in here today and also the focus of our hearts as we go into the rest of this day where, hey, we're like, hey, or maybe you worked out and Lisa was reminding us about the truth. Good morning, Adriana. There's plenty of chairs in there. Um, but um, also just that when we leave here, we can keep our mind fixed and focused on Jesus as our axis, right? We talked about that last week. He's the axis, the axis of which everything spins around. So if you guys, if we could bow our heads, I'm going to open us up in prayer and then we'll uh, we'll dive in. So dear Heavenly Father, just thank you. Thank you today that we worship the one true king that is on the throne. And we just need to give you true thanks and real praise for that right now. Help us to just love our neighbors even more today, Lord, and calm our anxious hearts. Help us to be at peace knowing you are on the throne. Open our eyes right now, God, just to what you can accomplish through us. Help to make us servants of others and to make a difference through us. As we just learn throughout these next few weeks how to die to self and to live for you. To live is Christ. That is our, our mission here, just to be in communion with you, God. Give us a word, place just something on our heart today throughout this time where we can just continue to fix our hearts and our minds on you. We love you, Lord. We're grateful for the women that are in the study, the ones that can't be here. God, but just help us to just lean from your word and your truth today. And we love you, Lord. Amen. So, guys, um, wanted just to start off, if you have the study guide, I just want to start off with something in the back of the study guide. And if you don't have a study guide, that's really why I wanted to start off with this. Because it talks about, and this is what pretty much all of Philippians 2 is about, this word humility. And it's a really not an easy word to learn or to want to learn or to want to like right now for any of us. Um, but it's one that we need, we need to learn, we need to dive into. And um, so I'm going to be just reading and just talking to you on page 77 of the study guide. So the very, very end. And I wanted to read this to you guys. I know some of you don't have the study guide, um, but it says, all of our thoughts are not yielded to God. In fact, if anyone knew half of what goes down in our heads, we'd have no friends. I read that and I was like, Yep. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you for grace. Uh, but this is the beauty of the gospel. It is both worthy of our full selves and able to reconcile ourselves 
back to Christ. So if you have a pen or something, you can write this down where it says the beauty of the gospel reconciles us back to Christ. Like our sin, whatever it is that we are struggling with, the gospel is what brings it all back. That is the full circle. It's beautiful and transformative. The gospel forgives our folly and resets us in new ways every morning because his mercies are new every morning. I don't know about you guys, but that is from Lamentations 3. And that just, that's, I'm looking at Leslie because I say that verse and, and she reminded us of that. Um, we, we did a little spotlight on her when she said, you know, it's like every, every time I wake up or every time I come into exercise, it's like his mercies are new and I have this new hope. So we're grateful for that. We get a fresh start again and again and again. And we are going to be all over the place in our lives. But if we can have the posture and discipline of single-mindedness, the desire to please God, he will transform us. He will transform us. And the very last sentence, I want you to write this down or underline this where it says, our joy comes from the very thing we might steal it. We, the very thing that we think might steal it, laying down our lives. Okay, so that is where that true joy comes from. And I know we've been talking about this, but the whole point of the study, to know God, to love God, right? And then about joy, like how do we have joy? How do we have peace, Right. And it, it talks about in here, it's, it's through that humility. And that is the root of Philippians 2. If I could sum up Philippians 2, and that was what we read last week, and it just goes along with chapters 10 and 11 of the study, it talks about humility, dying to self. What does that mean? Serving others. How do we, how do, we do that? That's so hard, so much easier said than done. So we'll dive into that a little bit more in the end. I wanted to go in um, and read right here um, from, if you guys could open your books for me to chapter 10, and that's page 107, 108, and I'm just going to flip up here just to kind of keep us on track with what we've got here. And we have covered a lot of ground. When I was thinking, oh, we're just going to do two chapters, and then I was like, wow, this is just a lot. We're like rocking through the book. Does anyone else feel that way? Like it's going fast? I mean, it's so good. You want to dive into it. There's like, ah, oh, there's just not enough that we can just really dive into. So I just love that. And wanting to keep flipping, keep flipping. Last one of our part number eight. One more. Oh, we covered a lot. <laughs> um, reaching back to where we talked about surrender and knowing God, and then right here, choosing to be unafraid. So Matthew six twenty five is where I wanted to start. So if everybody could just open their Bibles. I mean, you got your book open now, but I want you to open up your Bible to Matthew six twenty five, and I'm just going to read over that right here. I just want to start with scripture, with truth, where it says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or what you drink or about your body or what you will wear. It is not important to look at these things, okay? And then it says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And then just I'm skipping down just a little bit more and it says, oh, you of little faith, so do not worry. What is it that we will eat or what shall we drink or what we will wear? And if you flip over to 34, here is just that truth it talks about. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble in its own. I just love reading that. That is true. That's what's in God's word. And I wanted to just dive into this chapter. It talks about being unafraid about anxiety. That's just this buzzword. We hear this all the time. But I really feel like, hey, we name it. We say it out loud. That's great. That's what we need to do. That's what we've been talking about. Like, one, be aware of your thoughts. Be aware of what is anxiety. 
you know, to flip it around, name it, bring it into the light, and then let it be redeemed, right? So definition of anxiety, feeling of uncertainty, worry, fear, and it's excessive and it's all-consuming. I mean, of course, there are different degrees of anxiety, right? I have a little anxiety about this. So com completely validated, you know, very validated. Um, but it's the what ifs, the what ifs. And I love how she talked about this in the book. And as I was reading and then rereading and then watching the news last night on so many of the things, it was like, here are the what ifs. You know, it was like the what ifs of this, the what ifs of this happened. And I was like, oh my gosh, God, this is so confirming. This is exactly where you want me right here, right now, because now we have weapons. And it's like these what ifs of the what ifs. Okay, but replace it, but with because God, you know, like because he already knows. And it goes into it right here. And I'm on page 109. And she says, the enemy has ensnared us with two little words. What if? Don't we all do that? Like, what if this? And what if this? And, and all we, we do it. But our tool for defeating the what if is not surprisingly found in two words. Just write this down and circle it. Because God. Because God clothed the lilies in the fields and feeds the birds in the air, we don't have to be anxious about tomorrow. There you go, Matthew 6, 25, right there. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts, our hope will not be put into shame. And then I love this one. This is one of my favorites. Because God chose to be saved by, he chose to save us by his strength. We can stand firm in our faith, no matter what the day holds. I just want you to cling to that. Um, I think that if we get that on a little note card, or a little half page through um, Ephesians. So before we leave, we're going to pass this out. But this directly correlates to Ephesians 3. I want to read it one more time. If you have an underlined, star this, sticky noted it, do it now. 109, right in the middle of the page. Because God cho chose us to be saved by his strength, not our own strength, his strength. We can stand firm in our faith no matter what the day holds. So Ephesians 3, and this is what I want us to, we're going to just memorize part of it, but I'm going to hand you guys a note card, and we're also going to send it to you guys at home later in the email, but I'm going to read this over you. I pray, this is Ephesians 3, 16, this is where it starts. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the spirit of your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Remember, we talked about dwell last week. That was like our, one of our big words. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love surpasses all knowledge and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. But here's where it gets really good. Okay, this, this one, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is in work within us. His power work within us. So I just want to break that down. He is able. Again, this is, I, I said we're going to repeat myself a lot. We do that a lot in here, but it's because we want it to stick. So Ephesians 3, 16, and just that whole passage, like underline it, star it, definitely one. Um, Matt, can we pass that out just so that they can have that and just kind of be looking at it? When, I, when my mind starts to go down the tank, um, I want to look at that. I want to be reminded of that. That is my weapon, you know? Um, I'm just going to be real with you. My daughter texted me in school yesterday, um, all caps, and I get this text of, why am I here? This is the most terrible day. What do I do? And it was like 16 texts broken up with all caps. And I'm like, you're not supposed to be texting me at school. <laughs> you know, no phones at school. But then I was thinking, oh my gosh, what is it that I'm going to tell her? Like, I, I, I would need her to replace negativity with truth. So it's like, all I could do was, I was like, he, you're not able to do it, but let's put truth. Let's download truth into your mind about what is true. And just look at this for just a moment. 
Look at, like, here's what we can do. No, you are not able. No, things might not be going the way you want them to be going right now. But God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more. Switch it. Power of interruption. And she talks about that there. And the podcast talked about that, too. It was so good about the power of interruption. Like, we make the choice. Like we said, that was our, that is our overarching theme of the study. Is like, I have a choice about what my mind is doing. But if we feel it going in the spiral, bam, we have the power of interruption. And what do we want to interrupt it with? Good stuff. The truth. The word. So, Ephesians. Carolina, I yeah. to add to that. Add to that. Sometimes uh, maybe you feel like, oh, why do I still have to interrupt these thoughts? But I just want to throw that out there. Like, that's every day for the rest of our life that we're going to be interrupting these negative thoughts that come in. So, so we're not like waiting to arrive. Yeah, we're going to get better at it. We're going to, our minds are going to have more truth in it. But don't get down when you're like, man, I'm having to interrupt the same negative thoughts today as I did yesterday. The more you do it, um, yes, you will get better at it. But that is, is the rest of our life. That's how we're learning this truth that we can have the tools to interrupt it. But um, just an encouragement there, like this is, you're going to um, use this for life. And she talks about that, and I won't get into that, in even chapter 11. It just says, ask for this every day. You might have to ask for it every hour. You know, it's like bring it in over and over and again. Um, and it says, freedom begins when we notice what it is that is binding us, and then we interrupt it with the truth. And that is on page 109. So, that, so we notice, we have the awareness, the power of interruption, and then we replace it with truth. That's like... Okay, here's the steps. Here's what I do, right? And Paul just in Philippians, again, gives us that encouragement. Here he is in prison, and he's trying to encourage us in prison. Like, you can do this. I want to encourage you. So we have to choose to surrender our fears to God. And it talks about in Philippians 4, and we'll read this in a little bit later. But again, there's just so many things in Scripture that talks about anxiety where it's like, oh, anxiety is a new word. Really, it's not. You know, it's been around for forever. We're just using it a lot more in more negative ways, in those cynicism ways, right? But we need to choose, and she talks about this again. So flip with me over to page 112. So right up in the beginning, if you haven't starred Philippians 4, I just love that the book is real, it's funny, it's it's tough, but also she's got scripture like flat out laid out in the book for us, you know. So Philippians 4, I put a little sticky note on there, right there, a really great one for us. And I think Valerie even put this in the group me this past week, how that was really helpful for her. But it's like, here's our weapons again. And what do we do at the very bottom? One, we have to choose to be grateful. Two, we have to choose to think about what is true, noble, right, lovely, pure. And then 113, she's bolded it. I started and underlined it says, God has called us to hope, to joy, and to perseverance, and to think on what is true over and over and over again. And so I don't know, last week we gave us the homework where it was like the little map of like, what are you thinking? Catch the thought, right? Redo it. So if you haven't gotten a chance to do that, you know, I really want us to spend some time doing that for here. It's in, it's in the book, too, on page 115. Um, 114 and 115, so good. It says, truth is the most powerful weapon we have against the enemy. The very bottom of that page, to me, to live is Christ, is to die is gain. And if I'm going to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. Well, we know what we're going to choose. We choose the weapon of truth over and over and over again. So I just love that. So going on to 116, and this, especially with this past week, with um, some struggles um, that we've been dealing with at our house with teenagers and the battle of the mind. Um, so good, so good, so good. Right in the middle of the page, she says, my feelings are, are, my feelings are based largely not on what is real, but on made-up narratives in my head. Is anybody else with me here? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, yes. What is real? 
What is real? God is real. He is not going anywhere, even if my mind jumps to all kinds of dark places. I can't rely on my thoughts or feelings to hold my faith in place. God holds my faith in place. Over and over again. That is that truth. Sticky note that highlighted. God is real. We can't rely on our thoughts or our feelings to hold our faith in place. And so many times, you know, I ask myself, you know, sometimes like, I don't hear you, God. Why do I not hear you? Or why are you not answering me? And, you know, with teenagers or even an 11 year old or any age, but, you know, mom, he's not answering me. Like, is he really real? Because I don't feel him and things are still hard. They're not getting easier. You know, why? You know, I'm still asking, but I'm not hearing. And so to be able to come back with, he is real. He holds our faith in place, right? He's there with us. He is there. He holds our faith in place. Um, and I put on here, this just makes me think about that song, um, It Is Well With My Soul. And Bethel Music sings that. If you haven't, I'll put it on the group me. I don't know if I did. Um, but I mentioned it earlier a couple of weeks ago, but it just talks about, you know, the song is saying, it is well with my soul, like God, I want to glorify you. But she's not really feeling that but sometimes we just have to preach the truth to our hearts to make the feelings follow later right so again and again and again like it is well it is well um that's why a lot of times lisa and i tell y'all to smile in here when you're working out it's like tell your brain you're doing something good tell your brain you're doing something good so what do we do with the toxic thoughts again we take them captive we come back four things we need to do so, and we've written these down, but I want to write them down again. One, awareness. Two, we confront the thoughts. And that was the whole thing last week about community. Bring it into the light. Talk about it with people, right? We live in better in community. We encourage each other. But then once we do those things, we replace. That was this big thing. It's not just like, oh, bring it into the light. Oh, I'm aware of these toxic thoughts. It's like, no, now you have to do something about it. That's the difference from the very beginning where she talks about we're redeemed. We're not just turning into from a horse to a faster horse. We're turning from a horse into a unicorn. Like that's the true piece of transformation. We have to replace, replace, and we have to trust. We have exactly what we need when we need it. Trust over fear. So I want you to write that down. Trust really big with that big sign where it's like, the bigger sign over to fear. And then everyone, I want to turn to uh, Philippians 2, 5. So right in Philippians 2, 5. So if you're there, we're going to try to open that up. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So right here, it tells us in Philippians 2, this is why we were really diving into this this, this last week, about what how it is we should be acting, right? Trusting over fear, having the heart of a savior, I mean, of the, the heart of just a humble servant, the humble servant. So we choose to trust. So and if you go on to page 119 in your book, I love how she gives you, you know, these, these basically it's like, I'm having this, so choose this. Like, I'm afraid of being found out. Well, choose to believe that God knows every thought before I think it and he loves me. I'm afraid of failing miserably for everyone to see. Well, like, that is, that's me, y'all. I mean, really, like, I mean, that's, that's like my Enneagram type. So I just, and we all are so different, but I was diving into this. I was like, oh my gosh, 
You know, I think we're all, but if I choose to believe God specializes in taking my weaknesses and using them for his strength, right? So we have to make the choice. We state the fear statement, whatever it is, but then we switch it around to say, but I trust. We become anxious for nothing over and over and over again. And here it is, Lisa, exactly what you mentioned. It's on page 121 at the bottom. And it says, we remind ourselves who God is. We cast our anxieties on him. You may have to do this a hundred times a day, right? I know I do, or much, much more. And we claim the peace of God as our promise. I love that. I think we need to write that down. We have to do this a hundred times a day. We, what is it that we have to do? We claim the peace of God as the promise. He's already won the battle. He's done it. He's done it. He's done it. He is enough for us. So we claim the peace. So I love that. And that was it for the most part about chapter 10. I mean, there's a lot of really great stuff in there. Um, but just surrendering um, being, you know, the main part of being unafraid. And then we move into the beautiful interruption and the, I don't know about y'all, but these past few mornings in Athens have been glorious. If you've gotten up, it was like crisp. The colors in the sky were pink, orange, and then just now it's just this beautiful blue. And it's like, oh my gosh, the awe and wonder, God, that you would give us this right here on a day where we really need to see your goodness, right? I, and I just love that. And I honestly didn't really know too much about what the word cynicism meant before not like an English person. So, um, so this is really good for me to dive into. What is it? So cynicism, driven by fear of the future or anger at the past. So I was just trying to think about that and I was thinking about, okay, cynicism, what, what is that to me? Like, where am I cynic? Because I feel like I'm a pretty positive person most of the time. But then when it comes to certain things, I was thinking of and I'm always just going to be real with y'all. Um, like my husband getting home late, like many, many nights in a row. And then I just expected him to be late. But then my heart kind of hardened a little bit. And I was like, well, I'm going to be late, you know? And so, but just noticing that really even just helped me just this week to just say like, okay, I'm not going to let my heart be hardened by this. I don't want to be a cynic. You know, I don't want because of, anger in the past to like affect me going forward to affect my children and then to affect my children's children. You know, I don't want that at all. So we ask ourselves these questions and I'm on page 127. And if you haven't asked yourself these questions yet, it's also in the study guide on um, session three. She kind of goes through this inventory. It's very humbling uh, to go through the inventory for yourself. Cause I was, again, I was like, I'm not a cynic. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe I know, you know, so if you haven't gone through that, but just asking yourselves these questions, you know, um, do you quickly notice people's flaws? You know, uh, do you get annoyed when people are optimistic? I mean, not all of them, but maybe there's one or two that kind of resonates with you. And then on page 128, she says, cynicism is destroying our ability to delight in the world around us and fully engage with others. I thought, you know, that is so, so true. Because again, when I'm more negative toward a situation or like I was telling you guys with Kelly, say maybe he was late multiple, multiple, three times in a row. Well, then I become a little cynical and then I don't really want to engage as much. My heart is a little more cold, you know, and then maybe it's with a friend, you know, maybe they've not shown up or they've done something over and over and over again with you and you just, your, your heart just becomes a little cold, right? Well, God has an abundance of joy and delight for us, and we're missing it when our arms are crossed. That was really just, like, it hit me um, hard in the heart this past week. Delight in God and his goodness tears down our walls and allows hope, trust, and worship to flood in. I just love that. I love that. Really, really. And that um, brings us down to um, Romans 8.28. That's a great one. So if you've got your word, I want you to grab that, Romans 
And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. He works all things. So this lie that us cynics, or maybe we just have this much cynicism in us is, you know, people aren't trustworthy and life's just really not going to work out right. Or work out maybe the way in your mind you think it's going to work out, right? Like we've all got our plan of the way things should be. But I mean, that's honestly probably not the way God has it. The truth is God is trustworthy and in the end work all things together for his good. Is good, and that is what is stated in that Romans eight twenty eight. And then we choose to delight in Him and the signs of His work in the world around us. I love that. Uh, and it's talking about what is true. God is trustworthy. Like if there's anything you can get out of that, that is what you want to just highlight, pinpoint. What is true? God is trustworthy. Fear sets us up a protective shell of cynicism that blocks our potential for joy. And that right there, I think you just need to write that down. Fear sets us up for a protect sets up a protective shell of cynicism that blocks our potential for joy. And that's on right around page 133. Um, but I really that's so so true. If you really just stop to think about it, you know, it's like I feel like in Bible study in this hour, we're just throwing a lot of things. And even in the book, like it's, it's a lot. There's a lot of stuff. But trying to take some time just to download on your own in your own quiet time, like, am I cynical? Or do I know someone that's cynical? And maybe I need to pray for that person. Or is there like just a little section in my life? And how can I replace that with delight? And God's goodness. By rejoicing in the Lord, Philippians 4, again, God's goodness and the beauty. And this, to me, was an aha moment. And again, I was outside walking the dog. And if you turn to page 139, so we're just flipping over a little bit. And you're talking about the power of interruptions with so many different things, with our thoughts, with truth. But when we talk about beauty interrupting, beauty floods in and interrupts when instead of cynicism, we choose to trust. And this is what it it says, when we worship, we experience awe, right? If you think about this, when we are outside, like, oh my gosh, this is a beautiful day. We're not thinking about negative thoughts, right? We're not thinking about, oh, this isn't really going well. Or maybe you're listening to a praise song. Like that to me is just a form of worship where I'm not thinking about negativity. I'm thinking about the praise song. So cynicism and worship cannot coexist. They absolutely cannot be together in the same place, right? That's how I feel about exercising and thinking about our exercise or our walk as a form of worship. Just like we can't do both of those things together. Well, we're not in here thinking about, you know, negative thoughts. No, we're trying to download truth as we move our bodies. We're grateful to be able to move our bodies. So if you get anything out of this whole cynicism chapter, Think about cynicism and worship cannot coexist. So what do we need to do? Bring worship into all parts of our day, right? A spiritual act of worship can be anything. And we, we go over this, you know, where you're folding your laundry. Maybe you're listening to praise songs. Maybe you're cleaning your kitchen and you're just praying over whoever's dish you're cleaning. Um, or you're doing something around your house, but you're praying for people in Bible study, like bring that form of worship into just the everyday moments of your life. So Jesus first chose us. He rescued us in his beauty and in his kindness. And that makes his promises forever and eternal. And, and I love this. And um, this is on page 142. And it just brings it all back. Jesus came for us. He came for you. He came for me with our arms crossed, with our cynical selves, right? Or whatever it is we're bringing to the table. Bitter, cranky, unsure, doubting, negative us. She says, I know I said the interrupting thoughts that shift all the others is I have a choice. But it's because Jesus chose us. He busted down the door and he rescued us in his beauty and his kindness. He suited up and he came for us. And I just want to tell you guys, 
he's going to come for us again, right? Like we have to just know that that is true and that it's eternal. And that's how we shift, shift, shift our mind. The lasting joy, Christ is in the center of it all. And that's how we just shift the mind from being cynical, right? To being, to delight, to awe. So to just worshiping him. And then that's how that cynicism, just a bit, it's not going to go away right away. And it's with all the other things we talked about earlier in the weeks, finding time for stillness, finding community in our people that are encouraging, that want to build us up in Christ. Okay. So I want to turn now to Philippians 2 and the study guide and talking, just diving into for just our, our minute last few bits in here about humility. And how important this is when we are the weapons we use, part one. So it goes into, and I'm on right around page 55. Uh, well, actually, page 44, the very bottom, Philippians 2. Paul is urging the Philippian church to empty themselves for others, gloriously embodied by Christ's submission to God's by taking on the form of a man and laying down his life for God's glory and our good. You see, Paul understands the human condition and he knows the struggle of the Philippian church. It's our struggle too. We don't want to think about others. Paul knows our minds and our actions. Our bodies always move in the direction of our head, the way our head is turned. And that, I just wrote a picture of the cross right there. So we have a study guide or something, but our bodies move in the direction that our heads are turned. So remind yourself of the cross. We want to be able to look up, but then we also want to be able to look out. Open arms. That is the picture of humility, right? Like looking up to him and then looking out and serving others, serving others. And that humility, that is just that that weapon that we just have to use, we have to keep coming back to over and over and over again. So I wanted to read, I'm flipping back to Philippians now, and if you didn't get a chance to read it, I wanted to read you just this first, we read part of it already, but it's short. Philippians 2 is short. So if you haven't read it, I want to encourage you to just read the whole thing through, underline, highlight. Um, what I love about the whole book of Philippians is that it's like the greatest hits of the Bible. You know, it's like, oh, the joy. And here Paul is in prison. And he's like, oh, it's the greatest hits. Like, let's still have joy. I still want to encourage you guys. And then I'm going to tell you about my friends, Timothy and Ephrodite, because I don't even know if I said that right. But, you know, at the end of this, he's like, let me tell you about our friends that are just like us, completely normal people, but that are doing awesome things for the Lord. So Philippians 2, imitating Christ's humility. That's whole theme of this Philippians 2. Here we have Paul sitting in jail, talking to the Philippians, and he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. And then right here, we want to underline this, Star this, here's the verse of humility. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others above yourself. Each of you should not look to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. Your attitude, and we already read that, should be the same as Christ Jesus. So it's like he's outlining in here, here's what I want you to do. Please do this for me. Do this, do this, do this. And then he shows us, you know, here's what, what Jesus did for us. Here's exactly how it was done. It was laid out, right? The humanness of Jesus being dead on the cross. And then, I mean, he did that for us. He humbled himself completely for us. And it says, I choose others above myself. So I think we should all need to write that down. Sometimes when you write things down or put the notes in your phone, maybe you set it as a reminder, I'm going to choose others over myself. And it starts in my mind completely. So then we go into Philippians 2. 
really diving into, you know, what is humility? And I just wanted to take a minute because a lot of times, like I said, we're throwing a lot, a lot of stuff is in here, but I want you to take just a minute. And if you're at home, think of someone that has this Christ-like characteristics in you, that you know of in your life and just jot it down and you just take a minute to do that. I want everybody just to actually have a minute just to think. We're not going to ask you to like say it out loud, but maybe just take a minute and just think, who is there? Is there someone that you know? And then under that, I want you just to describe one characteristic that this person has that like displays humility. What is it in your mind? Let's really download that and think about that. So as we go into, if you're still writing, just keep writing. I'm just going to talk a little bit around that. So as you're finishing writing that, you know, the, the book of Philippians is this epistle of joy, talking about joy. Paul's trying to tell us, here's how we do it. And it comes from Christ, right? And in one, we learned, and in the book two, it talks about Christ gives us joy when we're in community. It talks about that. Christ can still give us joy in persecution. And then this last part, Christ gives joy in humility. So it's just in the second chapter, Paul just echoes the language when he calls himself a servant. That's in Philippians 1.1. And then he says this radical idea that joy actually comes not through glory, but through humility. And we find joy in Christ when, like him, we clothe ourselves in humility. And that's another just scripture taken out of Peter um, that just talks about that over and over and over again. So one of my homeworks to you guys is going to be the person that you wrote down and you thought about. I want you to send them a text, maybe give them a call, or just write them a little letter just thanking them. Let's actually be Jesus' hands and feet. Doesn't have to be a lot, but just say, hey, thank you for showing me humility. Like, this is the way I want to live my life, or I want to take this characteristic that you have and, and really do this moving forward. You don't know how that could impact somebody. Plus, somebody might no, not know that, like, a characteristic that you saw in them displayed that. It's always great to, like, point out and pick out those really great moments and other people that you see, and I know it would really bless that person. So as we're moving on through the study, just reading through Philippians 2, just want to break it down just a little bit more as we just move on and describe the things that would make Paul's joy complete, and that's through verses 1 through 4. And what Paul talks about in there, and I just wanted to break it down into basically one word. And if you just wanted to write one word out to the side, it was, it'd be united. He makes our joy complete when we're like-minded in the same love and the same spirit. So again, to live is Christ when we are united as people, but also united in him. That is the thing that would make Paul's joy complete. And then right into five, Paul is about to lay out the summary of the gospel. Who or what is Paul hoping this will impact? All relationships. He wants to impact everybody, okay? Because then he goes into, and it talks about, um, the, I'm just flipping right over in the next page on page 58 in the study guide in verses 19 through 30, and I had never really been able to dive in and understand, like, this is so great about humility. Why is he now talking about Timothy and Aphrodite? It's like, I didn't really understand that. Like, this is great and all, but what does this really have to do with it? 
He's just bringing it down to our level. And like back then, I mean, he was just saying, hey, these are two ordinary, very ordinary people living out ordinary lives just like us, but they are willing to be servants of the gospel, willing to do whatever. So he's telling the Philippians like, hey, I've got these two friends over here, ordinary people, but they're doing some extraordinary things. And I just know that's what God has for us. Ordinary people able to do extraordinary things for the gospel. And that just brings it all right back around to that Ephesians 3 where we say, well, I'm not able to do this. Or then that there's our mind kicking in and say, well, I'm not gifted in this area. Or I'm not. But God is able to do abundantly more than we could ever, ever, ever imagine. Right? That is what is true. Just keep believing that because it tells us right here, these two average people were willing to be servants. And they didn't know. They thought Paul was going to die. He was in prison. Right? So I just I love that. And at the very end of Philippians 2, I'm going to start with 29. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor, men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give. So really just saying like these people were willing to be complete servants, really moving forward, not knowing what they were even getting into, but they were willing to lay down their life. And that is what a humble servant does. So going down to the very bottom of the study guide on um, 59, it said, we are transformed by the renewal of our minds. We renew our minds by filling our minds with truth with who God says we are, then holding up every other thought to those truths. Those truths are weapons, and they stop the spiral of our minds. And then to flip to the next page, we get the true picture of humility. Lasting joy will come only when God is in the center. Not when I am empowered, but when I rest in his power. I love that. I had to write that right here at this very last little point that I just thought was so important that I wanted you guys to write down and just to keep in your brain. If you can like take one thing away from the study, this book or Philippians, it is that it is not when Christ is in the center. It's not when I am empowered, but when I rest in God's power and when we trust. I always to talk a lot about that earlier, that trust so good. So highlight, star that, all of the things. And then that resting in God's power brings us back to what we already talked about, about having time and stillness and in quiet, eliminating the noise, right? And just trying to focus in on listening to what God has for us and replacing whatever that negativity is with what we're learning and here. So wanted to just ask a couple of little questions as we go into just finishing this week, moving into the next three chapters where we're again, just really trying to figure out what are the weapons and how do we use them? But wanted to ask you this question because it goes along with cynicism. It goes along with what we learned last week. And I love this. What are the loudest voices of distraction in your life? And what would happen if they were paused? You don't have to answer that right now, but I do just want you to write that down. I think that is just a really great question. When we are so much about the study, like I said, we're not breaking up into small groups. We're not hashing this out. This is really about doing the inner work of our hearts and our minds. What are the loudest voices of distraction in your life and what would happen if they were paused? And then another question, and, and these will be great. I don't know if you guys have, I know some of you have been able to connect accountability wise, but if you have somebody you want to walk or talk with or just call and say, hey, can we just, I want to bring these questions into the light because once brought into the light, I feel like the enemy won't attack me with these things anymore. Maybe these are something you talk with somebody about, your friend, accountability partner, maybe your counselor. Um, what are you most cynical about? 
So just bring it back to cynicism. What is one of the things that you're most cynical about? And then the last one about humility. Do you feel that humility is seen as a weakness? So just something to write down and just to think on and pray over. And if so, why? And then how can we switch that? And how can we just know and believe that lasting joy is found when Christ is in the center? When I am not empowered, but when I rest in God's power. So guys, I wanted to just um, go through, and if you haven't done the study guide or just even looked at it, do that, do that. But there was one project that um, was really great. And it was on one page, it's on page 71, and it said, consider, draw a picture of everything you could ever want for yourself. Well, I'm say like type A, uh, perfectionist, that I'm like, I can't draw, I'm not gonna draw it. I'm gonna write it out because it's gonna be bad. So anyway, but then I was like, okay, release it. So, but I just wrote out the things that, um, it says, write out all the things you would ever want for yourself, right? It's like, write it all out. So I would challenge you to do that because once you do, just now stare at the picture. If you really got all that you want today, would it really make you happy? Very convicting. Because the enemy has tricked us into believing that it would, but true joy is laying down all we could ever want in humility. Oh, this gives me the chills. Um, because that's so true, isn't it? Can everyone just... The enemy has tricked us to think that, you know, and even like some of the stuff in my paper was really great, right? It was so great. Like speaking to women, that would be so great. Love doing that more and knowing the word, like all that is so great, right? But is that really what's going to deep down make me the happiest? No, no. Lasting joy, finding Christ is in the center when we rest in his power, surrender, surrender it all. So again, Again, if you have the study guide, it'd be great to just kind of finish up with the little projects. They really don't take long. They look a lot longer than they take. They don't take long at all. But really, really good to remind us where our access needs to be on Jesus. And then to keep our mind focused on the upward where our eyes go is where our body goes. And then where our arms go is how we can serve and love. Um, so Leslie's going to close us in prayer and Leslie will come up here. That'd be great. Um, homework for next week is going to be, um, to read. And if you open up the inside of your book, I want to just make sure, and I've like got little stickies, um, 12, 13, and 14, and it all runs together. So don't get overwhelmed. It's a lot. It goes super fast. Okay. And if you haven't listened to the podcast, the Bob Golf one, amazing. Okay, we love Bob Golf, and um, and there's uh, just some really great ones again on humility, and it's just like going to recap what we just talked about. But again, we're learning it. We're learning it from the word. We're learning it from the book. We're again learning it in here, and then I want you to download it again and listen to it while you're walking. Listen to it while you're worshiping. You're doing your laundry, like. Download the good stuff. By golly, we need as much good stuff as humanly possible right now. So do it. Listen to it. And then also, I just wanted to show you guys a couple of books um, that I just keep on my bedside table and have been encouraged to me just from other friends. But um, one, this book, it's called Think for Eight. And there's like a teen version of this as well. Um, and that's Philippians 4 8. So it's like, okay, negative thoughts, think for eight. Um, a really, really great one, and just a tiny little with good nuggets. And then this one, Elizabeth encouraged me to read this, uh, Power Thoughts by Joyce Meyer. And it really breaks it down great in the book, but what I love is the very last page. It just has all the power thoughts written out. Um, so if you're looking for just a couple other things to couple this with, if you know, you're having a hard time, I get it. And 
you know, it's like, we need all this stuff. And I love it. I've even this week, I've had people sending me other, like, you read this book. This is a really great one. Like, send them to us. Like, that could be the next study. Or like Lisa said, from the back of the book, like, oh, dive it in. Let's read this one next. Like, this is just the tip of the iceberg for us in our minds, right? Like, we're always a work in process. So we'll shoot you the email um, at home about the things that the homework, the podcast, all that good stuff. Um, Natalie has a little scripture card, so if you're over here, we'll get that. But our goal is to memorize that um, Ephesians 3, 16, that little nugget. Let's, Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for talking to us through your word. That's just amazing. Don't let us take it for granted, Lord. And Father, I thank you that you tell us right at the beginning of Philippians um, that you're going to complete the good work you began in us. So Father, help us to realize that it's sort of a proud thing to think we can fix ourselves. Help us to just open our hands and open our hearts and open our minds and surrender ourselves to you. Help us to ask you, Lord, to change our minds, to change our hearts. And help us to trust that promise that you're going to complete the good work you began in each one of us. You are going to give us your mind. You are going to give us your thoughts. You are going to move lies to truth. So we trust you. We want to trust you. And um, we're thankful for the good work that you're going to complete in us. And we pray, Lord, in your precious, precious name, Jesus. Guys, have a great day. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye bye. Good to see you. Bye bye.